my little laptop. Okay. All right. Hi everyone. And welcome again to my audio visual channel. Today, I bring you episode number five of conversations about art, during which I try to find out the meaning and purpose of both art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. This time, I will have this conversation with Roberta Osti, who was my cast drawing teacher at the New York Academy of Art. Uh, one of the things that blew my mind the first day of the first class, which I think was with, with Roberta, was that uh, his hands were dirty with charcoal, as if he had just left his own studio and came directly to the school to teach us, and I just thought that was kind of ridiculously cool. So, uh, Roberto, thank you so very much for being here and for your time. And why don't you please go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everyone that will listen or watch who you are and what you do. It's interesting to what people remember of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's so many things are not the well. You remember when you said this, you remember when you said that, and I don't remember. So the hand, the hand with char dirty with charcoal is, is the first. So it's quite, I'm going to add it to my <laughs> list of how I'll be remembered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, so um, my name is Roberto Osti, and um, um, I um, have a, a background in um, medical scientific illustration. Um, my my uh, passion is is anatomy and figure drawing, and um, I studied anatomy um, at the University of Bologna uh, in a specific program for scientific art. And uh, when I moved to the States, um, actually a decade after I moved to the States, I enrolled in the um, master uh, program at the New York Academy of Art, where I studied anatomy, but this time for um, artistic purposes. Mm. And uh, as I, um, when I was studying uh, with um, Martha Meyer at the Bakker and um, John Horn, mm -hmm. uh, anatomy for uh, also Frank Porto, uh, I remember um, that um, it struck me how anatomy for artists is not the same as anatomy for uh, uh, medical purposes, which seems like intuitive now, but it wasn't then because um, um, I had to figure out why is that it's always the same body, the same bones, the same muscle. It's the, it's the purpose, it's the use that we put the knowledge of anatomy to it. So um, anatomy, study anatomy for um, medical purposes is for uh, healing purposes. Mm. So doctors don't care about um, the aesthetics, they don't mm. care about the proportion, but we do. So anatomy for um, um, artistic purpose, it is directed toward aesthetic and narrative purpose. So it's very different, very different approach. Um, we don't really care much about the deep muscle or uh, the intestines, for example, the lungs and the heart and, and etc. cetera. Um, but um, but um, doctors do. Mm. So, um, uh this this but i had to say that um in my experience having an understanding of both approaches to to anatomy kind of helped me quite a lot to um form my pedagogy around it in the sense that um when i teach anatomy i try not to um impose my stylistic my aesthetic understanding Mm -hmm. So I try to give information as uh, uh, neutral, maybe neutral is not really the right word, but um, as, um, um, as, as, as essential as it is, without trying to impose my um, style or mannerism or uh, um, interpretation of, of the human form. Mm. Uh, that will be the uh, goal of the artists uh, and in fact I would say that when I look at the work of my student like like you, you Gabriella you take eventually uh, the notion that, that, that uh, um, I presented you guys with and you do whatever you want to do with it you use anatomy eventually as a vehicle uh, mm -hmm. for um, that that transports that carries your own aesthetic um, message whichever that might be mm. that's why i'm trying to keep my um 
uh, my teaching, the, 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 the information that I teach as, uh, as neutral as, as possible. Mm. Um, when I do my own thing, then I create this monster, create the flame monster. So that's mm. <laughs> my thing, but I'm not going to tell, you know, my student, you don't have to create flayed monster. That, that, yeah. that's <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, uh, um, of course, you know, I also draw, I also work on other topics. So I, I like a lot to, uh, collect. Uh, you, work, you work on what? I'm sorry. I didn't catch other, that. other topics, other, other, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. other, other subject, right? Yeah. Uh, but they are always connected with uh, some sort of catalogation of the universe, uh, mm. which is um, uh, collecting specimen, collecting things, collecting shells, collecting rocks, collecting bones, and then assemble them, uh, reassemble them um, in a, in a, if you want, in a very postmodern way, giving them a new meaning. So I do like to collect the triters of, of the universe, mm. things that got uh, mangled and tossed by waves and winds, etc. Uh, they had a previous identity and reassembled them, giving them a second identity. I find it very, very uh, fascinating, but I always like to start from the uh, natural world. So taking things that were alive, were part of the natural world, and then reuse them, charge them with the new meaning, give them a give them a second life mm -hmm. pretty much like a dr frankenstein but mm -hmm. but good yeah 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 okay so, yeah yeah no, i mean just i uh, you know I, um um i just wanted to throw this brief introduction just to if you have maybe some specific things that you want to discuss or some other direction we might, you want me to to take the discussion on you know, you know. no that 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 was uh, an excellent perfect place to start because there are several things. Uh, I, I don't think I knew that you were also a graduate of the New York Academy. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. pretty cool that you were able to work with Marth Martha Rollbacher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I talked to, I mean, you know, I, I also took drawing with Dan, uh, with Dan Thompson. And, and, Dan and, also yeah, was and yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he was, and he, he also speaks very highly of her uh, artistic anatomy prowess and her knowledge and just her general wisdom Absolutely. as an artist and as a teacher. Um, and um, I really enjoy the idea of what you were saying just now about collecting things through the act of, of drawing, because I mean, you know, you might pick up the things physically yourself when you go by the wheat, by the beach or like to the forest. Um, and then you have them in, in your possession, in your home or whatever it is. But then when you draw them, you like document them that way. And you continue their study in, in a way, you know, like um, like a, a bestiary or like the, the books of herbs, you know, yeah. like in the yeah. that that type of stuff. And actually, uh, I, I did have some idea that you'd that you had studied. I mean, not studied necessarily, because I don't think I knew that you studied scientific illustration, although that does make sense. I did know that you had a considerable career as a medical mm -hmm. a scientific is it is it medical illustrator or scientific illustrator medical illustrator but then also said so also i did uh, naturalistic illustration mm -hmm. for uh, quite a few years i worked as a medical illustrator for surgery and um except scientific american uh various oh, that's hospitals awesome. and things like that yeah. so yes i did see surgeries and, and did the drawing of the surgical you know operation and stuff especially when they were coming, doctors, or surgeon were coming up with new techniques. I was mm. kind of discussing with them and illustrating the technique. So there's always this kind of, um, I like this narrative that that is uh, the show, the steps in the creation yeah, yeah. of something. And I think there is a, so I think that art um, has, in general, right, um, has great affinities with, with science and religion. Yes. Uh, in science, science, because probably I think it's art, what it does, it's, it's has a, an analytical approach to the world, right? Mm -hmm. Critical, analytical. Uh -huh. analytical. But, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I want to interrupt you first. So, and so since you're, you're going into, into the relationship between art and science and the art and, and between art and what was the other thing? I'm sorry. Religion? Uh, religion, religion. Yeah. So, so why don't we, um, I'd like it in that case, if you first uh, talked a little bit about what is art in your opinion? 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's what the the, the, the definition of art first this before talking goes, about right? it. Okay, this, yeah. this introduction is where it goes, but I think the one when so so the element uh, for me that is more important. The two elements that are more important in art for me are exactly this: are some sort of a, um, analysis of mm. the human of the, of the human condition, but also the world, and uh, uh, a, a analysis that doesn't have to be necessarily um, a, a logical uh, end. I mean, the way we look at the, at the world, the way artists look at the world, sometimes they they look at scientific processes and then they mess with them or misinterpret them. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But that's part of that's part of the artist that also create create an alternative, not necessarily logical um, um, uh, approach to to the analysis of of the of the universe. Um, and um, th therefore, that's why I like this this cataloging of of um, things that, mm. that, that that live that are around. And if you want, it can be it could be comparable to um, the the fascination that um, in antiquity, well, in antiquity and during during the mostly during the Renaissance, uh, artists and popes and nobles had for fragments of classical art that was that were resurfacing in pieces, and those pieces uh, had an aesthetic independent from the original meaning that that piece of work had. Mm -hmm. Simply because they were not connected with the cultural uh, period anymore, it was lost, but also with the thesis. So the aesthetic of the fragment is something that really fascinates me, not just me, many, many, um, many artists also are fascinated by that. It's how you kind of use that, that, that will eventually um, make your, you can make your own interpretation of um, uh, how to use this fragment. So the fragment, be it a sculpture, be it uh, the head of Constantine or, or uh, the arm of the Alcon or, or whatnot is something that um, I relate to. Uh, I do it with shells, with bones, instead of doing with classical work. So mm -hmm. I, my, the natural world is my, uh, uh, my um, uh, field of research, I, where, I, where, I, where I scavenge my, my parts. The fragment, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's this idea of, of the list and cataloging, the catalogation of the universe, right? Mm. Making a list and then given uh, the scientists would catalog animals and yeah, give yeah, animals yeah. named islands and species and, ge and genus, etc. I do something similar, but not necessarily scientifically. I just create new thing, right? So that is that is one thing that art is, is, is transformation, is transformation interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, the religion, or I think there's an affinity in, in, with religion because I think art is also transcendence. So the, the transcendence and the transformation are, are the thing that I would most associate with art. Of course, aesthetic, right? Aesthetic is very important, but the transcendent aspect is simply um, uh, it's a make-believe kind of Kind of thing that is then believed by yourself mm. and a lot of people, right? So, like religion. So, mm. um, if I take a piece of paper, rub some graphite in it, and suddenly that is uh, Gabriella, mm -hmm. the portrait of Gabriella, right? Mm -hmm. And then people don't see that as a piece of paper with smear charcoal. It is yeah. this is a person, even if they know you, with with specific moral attribute, with specific narrative. We start imposing our narrative to that mm. to that piece of paper. That's transcendent, right? It becomes something else, uh, pretty much like 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 religion. The religion seeks transcendence, uh, but it also imposes transcendence or or on an idol, for example, on an image of a god, right? So um, transcending is is believing in something that transcends this, mm -hmm. but also when we see an image of a divinity, um, that that piece of wood we paint on it is not. Piece of wood we paint on it is a divinity that evokes a transcendent mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. So I think that these are the two the two most important things I would say that I associate with art or that define art with me for me. Uh, this um, this uh, uh, transcendent aspect, right? And and then the transformation. Transformation is is very important because that transformation is a very active um, uh, moment where mm -hmm. we we alchemically almost change transformation yeah 
change the nature of the thing, right? Um, I'm taking notes on the on the laptop. I'm not like replying to messages or anything. Just so you no, know. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. No, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so um, that's why I had to kind of introduce introduce the, the art and science and religion. Mm. I think they are really really intertwined uh, aspect of the, the, the how the human brain works, right? Yeah. Um, and if you want, they, they, they kind of reassume, well, kind of represent three really core aspects of, of who we are. And, and we all tend to gravitate around one of these three, but we don't really have a, usually just a think on in one way, right? So mm. uh, we kind of have a little bit of science, maybe a little bit of religion, maybe a lot of art, right? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have all this, uh, um, I believe that in contamination, I really do believe in contamination, in kind of interaction between uh, yeah. mm -hmm. the parts, overlap, overlapping, but also mixing up ingredients in different different levels. So um, when I, for example, just to give an example, practical example, when I teach, um, when I teach our techniques, right, I don't teach just one technique, mm -hmm. I teach at my best, of course, there are techniques that I, I, I'm better at and take it, I teach all techniques that are essential, I think, and uh, each technique has to be learned as if it were the only technique, meaning this is not better than that. Then once you understand four or five different techniques, because the technical aspect of making art is um, the greatest name for, for, for Duchamp, Duchamp, right? Technique is important, right? Mm -hmm. Retinal is important, is a great part of, uh, of, uh, of the creative process, but I teach um, these uh, different approaches because then when you, my students, understand the technique, then they can adopt whichever technique they want or mm. part of this or part of that, part of that. That is conducive to creativity. Mm. If I teach only one technique, I teach you my technique, then you become a clone of myself. Not right. a clone necessarily, but but my, my, my scope is not to tell you what, what is aesthetically or creatively uh, important is maybe it's how to to reach your own uh, um, aesthetic aesthetic mm. goal, and that's going to be your problem. So, but I think in my experience is that understanding uh, the, the, the technical um, the study of the technique really reveals things that you might not have thought about before. Because you you'd make a mark, you say, oh, same drawing, same subject, but one done with charcoal, one done with with uh, crayon mm -hmm. they're different yes. yeah yeah of course so do that you can see how that expands uh expand the, the creative possibilities of, um, of an artist just change the technique um the, the, the way i i like to compare it to how I, I like to compare this process is when you go to a library looking for a, for a book on incorrecto right or titian, and then you find a, a cooking book next to it mm -hmm. and say, ooh, cooking book. Yeah. Of course you don't find Tintoretto next to a cooking book, right? But as you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as you walk you, through the library. <laughs> well, it's, it's, as you walk the aisles, you say, oh, wow, nice colors in that uh, mm. of, of, uh, of lasagna, right? Maybe I should use that palette. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, no, I mean, I'm forced, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I think that... Um, being exposed to great diversity, uh, technical, um, cultural, etc., is um, probably the one of the main ingredients for uh, that lead to creativity. Mm. Um, okay, so um, I from this point that you're talking about te technical, just knowing different techniques uh, to produce work, then I want to go back to something else that I wanted to ask you, and then kind of walk back to where we are now. Um, because um, I guess I am curious about how you feel having been a medical illustrator for how long? Um, so I started in 80, 1980. Um, I started with the army in 1984, but I started probably, yeah, basically 1884. And then, uh, so... <laughs> 1984. Uh -huh. <laughs> 1984. I feel that old. Uh, 1984 until 2000, 2000 and something and one. That uh, is so long. That's like a, yeah. 
almost 20 years yeah yeah and then okay. i can work and then of course of course they um my practice oh, but the fine art kind of was not really one end the other began so i started in the late 90s to paint at the art student league and then start creating some fine arts in there um so this was never it's like in life is never this starts in that end right mm -hmm. uh, um the things were overlapping i start developing different um interests etc so right um so yeah, so 20 years 20 years 25 years as a percentage illustrator yeah, yeah okay yeah so i mean i guess i just wonder if you i mean if you were making personal work while you were doing the medical illustration type stuff because i mean i wonder how that uh, allowed you to look for your own aesthetic, like you were saying just now, like your own visual language in your own work, um, especially because you were doing it for so long. And I mean, I'm sure that they must, you know, they being the people that hire you to make the illustrations, they must uh, put a certain kind of limit to what you're doing. Because uh, I mean, and, and I mean, even if they do that, there is still like some of your own visual your artistic voice coming through, I'm sure, because mm -hmm. that's why not all medical illustrations are the same, because everybody has their own visual voice, their own mm -hmm. visual language. Uh, but then I wonder, I was wondering if you had a difficult time kind of finding effectively your own voice or like breaking out of being a medical illustrator, because um, <coughs> I kind of, I don't know what your thoughts are in the, on, the, on the atelier tradition in general, um, but I sometimes I get the impression that mm, somebody that, it, that, like chooses that as their or or that studies that or something it's i feel like it's kind of difficult for that individual to sort of break out of the atelier traditional whatever mm -hmm. voice um and kind of find their own you know to kind of i, I i'm not sure exactly how to explain it no, quite no, I yet but i understand very well what you're saying and and yeah. it's an interesting question actually so basically um i had all these so before before uh, being trained as a uh, medical illustrator I had five years in the uh, Art Institute, as mm. uh, in Italy we, we studied first in high school, but high school is already art school. Mm -hmm. so that was five years of painting, uh, drawing, sculpture, architecture, and that was based on fine arts. Mm -hmm. After that, and I, I, that ended up 19, after 19 I went to this the college, to University of Bologna, to scientific art. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to the fine arts. So, but the, the the interesting thing is is well it really depends how so already there was kind of going i wouldn't say back and forth but but kind of intertwining between mm. uh various discipline right uh but um, it's like the, the more than one technique that you were talking about kind uh, of yeah absolutely but yeah. also i mean having studied five years uh, art painting mm. sculpture and then mm. also, also art history mm. that is part of your formation so then then i started more specifically for, for medical research, but at the same time, I was always going to see shows in Florence about Leonardo, Michelangelo being lucky to, to be born in Italy. Then you have all this mm. beautiful. Bologna was the birthplace of anatomy. Um, Bologna was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, was started in 1370 to dissect again uh, in the university, right? Mm. Uh, because because uh, before that, it was problematic to dissect. It was problematic, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So and then Vesalius taught in Bologna, and uh, so it's just a uh, you know having been been kind of immersed in a place where where uh, all these diverse and different um, historical period, but also culture, were always there, and artistic approaches, um, mm. it it really helped to to not to keep things separate, yeah. uh, but but kind of as again in each it. Um, Contamination is complexity, least complexity, because you have to, you cannot really, um, so the one thing I don't like to do, I don't believe it, is a, a dogmatic approach mm. to the fine art, which I think of what, you, what you're referring to. And the dogmatic approach is if you want to reassure it, because it's trying to frame the approach to art very tightly, and this, this is it, you're doing it this way, this way, this way, everything else is anatomy. So it's very, I mean, um, limiting if you want mm. uh, in terms in terms of creativity right so you you're trained very well to create beautiful works but in terms of it's something new or creating um your own your own way of painting that's really hard uh that was not my case right that wasn't my case so um um but to give an example how really um 
the, my, the scientific illustration, medical illustration uh, career really helped me said, is I wanna give you this example um, of a work that I had to prepare, I prepared a few years ago for Scientific American. And um, it was um, a new technique this was about 1990, early, uh, late 90s, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, a new technique of this uh, scientist, this, this physician that um, created a system to regrow human tissues mm -hmm. in, uh, in a culture, in culture like, like a specific kind of, kind of petri dish, but by a tube. So what he did, he took uh, these uh, um, scaffolding made out of agar, made out of this algae, right? Um, of course, of course, you know, sterile and everything. He would then take uh, tissues from like chondrocyte or muscle cells, cartilage cells, etc., mm -hmm. and then put them in this scaffolding, and then put them into a, a culture. A, a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the human tissue would grow mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. and he said eventually would be able to recreate the uh, a, a, a human heart somebody loses an arm, right? And um, so I had, I illustrated that. I had prepared this illustration of an arm that gradually is growing in this sort of gigantic tube, right? Mm -hmm. And very detailed, I have it somewhere, I, um, very detailed, right? And um, because it was, my drawing was so descriptive, right? Um, I started believing it, meaning it's not possible. <laughs> you cannot do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, there are really problems, at least now, maybe they're, you know, maybe think, but now what, what scientists can do, they can regrow individual specific tissues. So yeah, yeah. somebody loses an ear, they can uh, um, grow an ear mm. onto this culture and then regraft the ear on your on your, your head, right? Or the nose or skin, etc. cetera. Yeah, skin grafts. Muscle, grass, right? muscle to the back. Creating a complex um, limb like an arm, right? It's not possible because the nerves they don't go where you want them to go. They go and I'm, they it's go. also more than one tissue. Yeah, it's a bunch of but, tissues. Yeah, but that's the thing. That what it was saying is that we get all these tissues, one for the bone, one mm -hmm. for the organ, put them all together yeah. in the shape of an arm, and then each one of these things is being infused, and then we grow them together. Now, it's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, at, at the so at the time, as I was doing this work, I thought I'm drawing something that is a beautiful lie. Mm -hmm. So it was some sort of contradiction in the sense that it's a highly it, a highly de de defined drawing showing something that is not cannot happen, mm -hmm. but it looks like it could happen mm -hmm. simply because. I am stating it very, very clearly in a defined way with artwork. So if I explain you very carefully a lie, you believe it. Yeah, yeah. And I found this incredibly fascinating. So um, so then that is where I found some sort of connection between art and science, because that thing was really not so much scientific, but, but some impossible, impossible um, experiments that was just theoretical but not not real and mm -hmm. uh and i found a great affinity with that work and and what art does or at least how eventually you can see how the connection between taking taking fragments right in my 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 own my own artistic research taking fragments the tritus of the universe as i call it putting it back together and then mm -hmm. creating something new yeah so that is quite that is quite fascinating for, for me right so, so the, the thing is, um, what I'm fascinated is by this interaction, these uh, uh, even even not not especially not planned interaction between things, right? Between culture, between people, between then and see what happened when they come together, because that mm. that creates results that you cannot really plan in advance. And that and that's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah. You know, you know that because because then if not if if so if you can plan and then obtain the result the result that you want, there's no creativity in there, mm. right? I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying. Right? So the, the, there's no nothing that takes a life of its own, uh, and and surprises you, like yeah, like painting for example that never 
and this is this is a, something that I always like to discuss with a student when a painting is too descriptive, too precise, mm. is that it's only about like the flowers, yes. mm -hmm. and then you, you get tired of it pretty quickly. I mean, this is this this, this, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. moment of amazement, right? Wow, and then that's where it ends. Yes, okay. Um, but when I, it works, it's yeah. not completely, completely sorry, just mm -hmm. it's no, not, sorry. Not completely finished, but it's just a vote you start describing. Then I can interpret it. You can interpret it. We all can interpret it. Yeah, yeah, way. the same thing. And, yeah, and takes a life of its own. So that is that is something that is is transcends transcend the the, uh, the intention of the artist, and then become alive in my head and your head and you know, that. Then that's a work that is now becoming not that doesn't belong to any anybody. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Okay, no, it's just that the last bit that you were talking about just now about really really detailed developed finished work. Really, I feel like it really. I find it ex extra satisfying because I feel like it's talking about hyperrealism, which I don't care for, uh, but I haven't been able to always, uh, really specify why I don't care for it. But I think that's a really good reason. Uh, that's a really good point against it in a way, because it's like it leaves no room for interpretation, not just on the part of the viewer, but there's no interpretation in part of the artist making the work because they're just trying to reproduce something as specifically as they can and and it's like all right but then where's the research where's yeah. the artistic voice where is the exactly. you know where's the thought process that you're going to let that you are going through as a person making the work and where, where's the artistic process that or whatever it is that you're leaving for the viewer to interpret mm -hmm. um and that's that's just really great and okay so i um but, but you to just a second yes but at the same time at the same time see what i'm doing also i'm also using paradoxically techniques that are highly detailed to create something that is absolutely not possible. Yes, sure. So, so you know, this, I mean, if, if I'm not against any technique. If you can use abstract, you can use, you can use uh, whatever you want, right? Um, but as long as you have, you create something that is interesting, new, etc. So uh, the, the paradox that I like to, to, to kind of um, use in my work is I, I use very highly detailed technique to create something that is absurd yeah right. yeah i mean um i mean detail doesn't immediately equate to hyper realism or even mm -hmm. realism to begin yeah. with so yeah. so no i mean I'm, I'm aware i'm aware of that for sure i mean um you know rendering rendering or developing a drawing or a painting a lot it doesn't does not immediately make it the same as hyper realism mm -hmm. and i mean i'm also aware that i mean you know i'm mm -hmm. i don't mean your work is pretty pretty detailed, right? But you kind of stretch and and deform it, and not deform, but yeah, you kind of push the limits on. on, yeah. on so that is that is quite 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 remarkable work you're doing. I really like it. Thanks. Right. Thank you for giving me permission to to. Oh my! To, to use the, the your no. work, work in your <laughs> No, are you kidding me? Thank thank you for in, involving me there. And like a little parenthesis, actually, um, yeah. Uh, Roberto has two amazing uh, anatomy books, and I'll put the link in the in the description of the video. And and he gave me the absolute honor of putting one of my drawings in that second book there. Um, and so the link for that is going to be in the description, so that um, wh whomever I mean I I um, uh, oblige everyone to get both because I mean it's really uh, amazing work. It's real and it's really cool actually. I mean now that I now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more, it's uh it's effectively like I mean you're using the term pollution or contamination mm -hmm. when, you know, two two things mixed together or more than two things whatever it is. And if and and I think effectively those books uh, your anatomy books are really good. It's a they're a really satisfying combination of what you know as a medical illustrator versus your artistic voice, mm -hmm. you know. Um, although maybe a little bit more of the of like the teacher sprinkled in, but still mm -hmm. like you know there's still like your your yeah, visual yeah. language is there, yeah. Yeah, you, you got to, yeah exactly it because what I tried to do is is really to create a systematic approach to the use of anatomy because uh, um, that is the difficult part, right? So anatomy is very complex, there's a lot of it, and we yeah, had to find our way through. So what I tried to do is systematize the approach, how to use uh, the different uh, methods, so be it. Uh, uh, stereometric, be it uh, the structural, anatomical, and eventually aesthetic, and the techniques. So bring them all together in in in, in a sequence, um, because um, um, because I don't think it has been done so far. Mm. I think that's what what really got uh, got me going. Just kind of systematize and approach anatomy because in anatomy, in many cases, it was not the case for me. Luckily, but in many cases, you see people that kind of 
copy a, a slave person, but mm -hmm. that's more like a, I'm rem memorizing, memorizing yeah. that yeah. mass of the mass of mass, but yeah, what do I do with it, right? Right. Uh, and that's the thing. So in order to use that, you have to understand specific things like proportion that are going to be connected with aesthetics, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, that is quite a more, uh, quite a little bit more of a longer approach and path, but at the same time, um, it opens up. Once you understand these, these how to read the human body, uh, anatomically and aesthetically and structurally, it opens up so many, so oh, many yeah, for sure. possibilities. The creativity is really stimulated, right? So it's really not about copying a piece of flesh that gives you understanding mm -hmm. of, of anatomy. It's just how you, um, how you conceptualize it. And, and the human body can be conceptualized in many different ways. Many different ways. Infinitely, Infinitely, almost, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so all right, so um, I, 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 I mean, you know that I'm a big fan of uh, anatomy as well, not just like medical anatomy, but artistic anatomy uh, for sure. And it really makes sense that uh, having had so much of the uh, medical illustration in your life, because uh, it makes sense that it um, gives a lot of the flavor to your work um, because, um, I mean, the way that anatomy is taught, even artistic anatomy, um, both, I think they're both taught in that fragmented way in mm -hmm. which that, you know, like you isolate the torso, you mm -hmm. isolate the leg or whatever it is. And then you set, or, you know, depending on the, whatever it is, they then separate mm -hmm. the different muscles or whatever parts, because for example, the netter's anatomy is that's how it's divided. Like the parts, it's like, oh, the head and then everything within the head and that kind of stuff. So. Um, I guess I just um, I kind of wanted to to kind of go over a little bit to see if I understand uh, what you were what, what you were telling me earlier. Um, so like this this whole thing about fragmenting things and then like studying the fragments and then putting them back together as something else with a completely new understanding mm -hmm. of whatever it is that you put together like the new like a chimera almost uh, that you put together. Um, so then you're you're taking nature's is language and then kind of making a whole other beast based based on that and then um there's then that transcends i mean with that i mean i guess i'd like it if you elaborated a little bit more on the actually if you elaborated a little bit more on the transcending part like what what exactly does that mean in in terms of art to, uh, that artist transcendence uh, you mentioned earlier. Um, well, it's it's uh, transcendence is is creating um, um, a different world, a different place, a different reality, a different mm -hmm. entity, a different aesthetic, right? So okay. it's something that is not existing before. Mm -hmm. We make it, right? We make it. So um, I like the arm thing, kind of that you were talking about. Thing, like 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 the old shell that i put together in this strange creatures right um uh like the heart with all these um and i have some drawing that maybe i, sh I don't have them here now but um yeah something that was not there before or mm -hmm. thing that had a meaning before and now i have they have a new meaning that means something else okay so um that that's how that's how i like to work, right? Have to work really, because what I like, what I like about this approach is that it's potentially infinite. Okay. Potentially okay. Infinite process, right? Yes. Okay. And all right. So then that makes sense uh, also with what you were saying about transformation. So then how how is that? Um, how would you say that is then divine? Like how how do you how would you say then that that has a, an aspect of divinity in there? Because. Uh, because divinity also is concerned with transcendence, right? Okay. So, so religion and divinity is, is concerned with. Um, maybe, well, maybe I can bring you a, a, an example that comes from the from the Catholic religion, right? Mm. Um, the saints, right? The saints are believed to, to be people that that. Um, like us, start from a human condition, which is material, and end up being spiritual, pure spiritual. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Well, they they redirect their own uh, material pulsion, right? For example, sexual or 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 um, 
last for thing, last for for wanting stuff, etc., or drinking or eating or whatnot, mm -hmm. toward a, a more metaphysical or religious or divinity. So uh, the, the 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 sexual lust is then is then directed toward the pure chaste love of God, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the love and just making kind of a silly example, right? but the love for drinking, uh, for for listening to music in a in a in a pub, right, and mm -hmm. <laughs> a rave party, right, mm -hmm. are then transformed into. Of course, there was no rave party in the Middle Ages. Actually, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> either way, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> different, but um, uh, they are directed now toward uh, yearning for the the choir of angels, right. So okay. basically, all these physical, material portion are redirected towards something that is that is uh, spiritual. Once you meaning meaning that you. So. The, during the Middle Ages, the body was considered a very important vehicle. It was not denied. It was considered an important vehicle to salvation because, mm -hmm. because, if you tame those portions you then have access to uh, the heights mm -hmm. of the divinity. If you don't tame them, then you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. uh, or going to hell, depend how much you don't tame, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to be always like kind of like the, the purgatory in the middle. Right? Um, but um, so so the body is an essential part. The physicality is an essential part uh, towards mm -hmm. salvation. Um, so um, this this is transcendence. If you transcend yourself, you, you, you move yourself from the situation of... Um, this is physicality, but mm -hmm. matter, and you move on to a level of spirit, that right? transcendence. Right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you change yourself from one condition to the next condition. So um, in this, I do see uh, a similarity with the work of the artist. It takes something that is, if you want, base material, right? also alchemically, al mm -hmm. alchemy, the, the, the mystical alchemy has a similar approach to it. Take something that's base material, and then you change it to something else mm -hmm. that in, in our case is uh, be, it becomes aesthetic if you want aesthetic is could also be the final goal be it god it could be aesthetic right mm -hmm. but it has this is an affinity between mm -hmm. something that is really pure or or, or a distilled like spirit right spirit come from from the, the, the distillation of, mm -hmm. yeah 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 so um does it does it Make sense this this connection or uh, it, it does it? yeah it, it does and um okay so all right so the 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 yes um the aesthetic and what was the other thing oh the s the aesthetic and divinity that that uh, we've been talking about um i kind of want to introduce another really big overarching term uh because i feel like it's at least coming from the term aesthetic and mm. that's beauty um, so I, I guess I wonder what, in that case, because, you know, the time has flown by, we're almost at three quarters of an hour at this point, oh, oh, okay. um, cause time flies where you have when you're having a good time. Um, yes. so I guess, I guess I wonder in that case, if you could, uh, tell me what is in your opinion, what is beauty and how, what role does it play in your work? If it's, if it even is present in your work or in that case, if it is, how would you say that it's present in your work? Well, I mean, um, beauty can can mean so many different things, right? To mm -hmm. to different people, and uh, uh, really, I think beauty is uh, um, something that um, something that is alive, something that is even if it's a piece of paper, is something that you look at this artwork, right, on a piece of paper on a canvas, and it becomes alive in the sense that. It just you cannot explain it. Mm -hmm. You cannot contain it completely. Like just like a person, right? You cannot own a piece of a, 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 a person. You well, people sadly did, right? Uh, do also today, but you cannot really, really uh, completely own somebody's thoughts, somebody's life, etc. So when it when they because that is that is specific. Uh, I get entity, right? That with uh, with thoughts, with passion, with love. So I think that when artwork achieves something that you look at it and you cannot completely explain it, meaning, meaning contain it, mm. right? Then 
that work is beautiful for me. Okay, so um, it, it, whatever that is, whatever that is, it could be performance art, it could be uh, video, no. <laughs> <laughs> the art I don't like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> after art, <laughs> whatever it is, as long as it has a <laughs> something that's a, oh wow, um, it just catch my head. Is wow, that is kind of really continues to produce a, a continuous source of uh, of amazement, mm. of uh, stimulation, and you think wow, this you basically you create a relationship with this, this artwork. To me, that that is that is beautiful. It is beautiful. Uh, it, it kind of it kind of tend to have an affinity. A work like this tend to have an affinity with life, right? Because because artwork that are so they last forever. Mm-hmm. So they they have a life. They they keep interacting with people and in different ways in in, in centuries. So that is the final final. You know, to me that that is. That is beauty, right? This, this sense of life or intellectual, cultural that that an artwork can and uh, emanate, right? Okay, so um, even though you said beauty is something that has a life of its own that can't be contained, um, you know, a life has a limit in the sense that things die, you know, but then the the way that you're describing beauty it really sounds like it's something that as soon as it kind of comes into existence it's immediately like eternal almost um, yeah. and so yeah. and so i mean i guess i wonder you know when we're making drawings or whatever it is that we're making i mean i guess i wonder if that if you know like if i wanted to kind of make it so that my whatever drawing that i make is beautiful and then also eternal is like how do i well you know, I, think, I think it's relative right so birds live up to like three or four or five years right uh-huh. then dog, cats 15 years human 80 85 hopefully mm-hmm. life uh little art forever <laughs> so, okay but i'm saying enough <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, i mean it's not something that <laughs> yeah yeah no that's fair <laughs> that we can really measure and maybe you know what sometimes these artworks are buried by by nasty critics and then they're re dug up and resuscitated by i mean we've seen like what happened with mannerism right with the uh in, in certain historical periods um uh, um hellenistic art was considered superior to classical art right mm-hmm. uh and then our artists i mean god knows other artists are rediscovered, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then reevaluated. Uh, mannerist went through that period, right? Um, so uh, they get brought, they get they get brought back to life somehow, and they become. So it's it's not like a linear, you know. Okay. Yeah. It's just, but sometimes you know people listen to you, sometimes people don't listen to you, and that's also for art, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surely depend, right? They depend. Look what happened during the during the Nazism, right? They were the they degenerate art uh, was seen as horrible, disgusting, and quite a lot of artwork destroyed. Mm-hmm. And then then you know saved, and luckily they're still with us. So really, really depend. But that is also the, 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 the I think I think a paradoxically a an artwork that's still alive. Meaning it it, 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 it generates, uh, it produces very, very uh, extreme reaction, but they are mm-hmm. reacting on the last. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and negative, positive, but they are kind of stimulate people and the So um, uh, I think that they, so I would distinguish artwork that are, I'm not for, I'm not saying that work that are just a, a, a nice artwork, it don't necessarily mm-hmm uh convey uh, a message etc art for that sometimes it's just beautiful beautiful drawing of a, of a academic drawing of a, of a body or a head just i want to have that it's beautiful why because i like it right mm-hmm. um so meaning meaning you know it's not just about doesn't have to be something that is always i mean transcendence can be can take many many faces right mm-hmm. and so if that work speaks to me and it's just a pretty little academic um work 
uh, made like 100 years ago by some some student in uh, the Art Student League. I love it. Just, I wish I had it, right? If I could buy it, I would buy it. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, so. But but the art that 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 that, that then um, creates something new. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. That's a different thing because a, a, an academic study doesn't really necessarily create anything new. Mm -hmm. But it's done. It's well done. There's passion. I do believe that when an artwork is done with passion, some fragment of the passion are imbued in, into the artwork, mm -hmm. and it keeps seeping out when we look at that. Right? You can see the person that did that, did it with passion, with, with, with love. That show, right? Just to give you a silly example, when I was in, in, in high school, actually my brother uh, was doing a technical drawing, right? And uh, um, he came home and uh, we were talking, and how did he go with you today with this technical drawing? He said, look, I did a cube, but the professor kind of scrapped it with a big cross on it and they mm. do it again. He said, why? Because he said that there is no passion in it, and we were like, "What? It's a cube!" <laughs> yeah. <But> then, <laughs> like really, you know, four six line, right? We thought that that's actually later on. That's actually an interesting concept. The passion yeah. in your work is visible. If you don't, if it's a purely technical, and you get bored with tears by copying a thing for like six months mm -hmm. uh, on the long pose, it just because it's aesthetic. It's just boring. But if you put passion and you put intensity in it, no matter what it is, that passion comes through. It's mm. visible. If it's just if it's just technical, it, it can, it's that. It's mechanical. You could be you could be drawing like a piece of a car, right? Mm. You have the same thing. But if it's if it's if the intention you put in it, be it whatever subject it might be, it can it's visible. So um, I think those works also are, are very interesting. But then don't necessarily change. Uh, create something new, mm -hmm. something, a new way of looking at the world, a new way of communicating, something that is now uh, representing our passion, our problem, our life in the moment we live in. That mm -hmm. is, and then, and then visualize that through an artwork. I think that's, that's the same as great art. So. Okay. Um, I, I would like it if you went a little bit more into this this whole thing that you've repeated a little bit throughout the conversation about creating something new um, or, or original because um, I, I, I personally feel that there kind of is no such thing in when humans create something. Um, I think the only thing we can create and have it be completely new is like another human, you know, like uh, giving when people have sex and they make a baby and then the woman gives birth like that uh but even then it's still based on the two previous i mean it's still like it's always empirical like it's still with gathered information and then digested and churned or like rearranged like you were like you were saying and given a new meaning but meaning but it still has a predecessor that is from yeah, nature but, you know yeah, well, i understand but i'm not talking about creatio ad right creating something from nothing we're not okay. talking about that okay uh that that is clearly not possible. We are mm. always uh, you cannot create, you know, something from nothing that yeah. is completely. That I don't believe in that is possible. But mm. that would also be an influence. If we would be able to do that, maybe it would be kind of what, what is that? We don't understand it, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but of course, we have uh, now access to knowledge, access to uh, we see other people art, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's the way we process it that gives us access to something new. Yes, that that's what I'm talking about. So the way I process thing is different from the way you process thing. The way you, and we might have influences, but um, the revisitation of a technique of work uh, produces something new. Mm -hmm. uh, how new? Well, you know, it's, it's a different level, right? But um, um, that I'm thinking that 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 kind of kind of kind of new. What am I talking about? Always, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that does. Yeah, okay. That that does make a lot more sense because um, uh, lots of times I've heard uh, other people say like, "Oh my God, you're the, this drawing that whoever made is so original or something," and 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 I just feel like the term is misused a little bit because I, because um, I also think that it's perfectly possible to remake something on un undetermined amount of times, but make it new again in a refreshing sort of way that doesn't feel like it's copying the predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I guess I guess um, it, it's from what you also said of seeing, sh uh, see both seeing and showing things in a new way. 
or from a different angle or whatever it is. Like it's still a new way of looking at something. Yeah. Uh, an example of that is uh, uh, um, uh, when I was a student at the academy, uh, John Jacobs Meyer, uh, he mm. showed us some works of uh, uh, Ted Schmidt. You remember Ted Schmidt? He was yeah. the, and uh, he beautiful, beautiful neoclassical, uh, it's the Renaissance inspired works, right? But in a modern way. And then he said something very, John Jacobs Meyer said something very, very smart, like all things he said are smart, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> incredibly smart right so um he said well look um um Ted Mitt work is informed by Picasso's work and it's true mm-hmm. it's true so even if even if uh uh, it, uh, uh, uh his um Ted Schmidt work is uh clearly inspired by by the Renaissance or by classical work Still, there is the, the, the revolution, the, the revolution of Picasso in the middle, and mm. those work are now charged with that, with that historical intervention of Picasso into, and and we cannot really um, avoid that. But he kind of now created a new tradition, arching back to the classical, but then going through being filtered by the the, the work of Picasso, the interpretation of Picasso. So. Uh, that is new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay, but but then how? Um, what was John Jacob? Jacob what was uh, JJ's argument about why it was influenced by Picasso? Is it just because Picasso effectively was a predecessor of all of us? Yeah, so in that case, he influences yeah, all of us because he's there. You know, okay. he, he did stuff, and he's he's there now. We know him, right? As you were saying, we know him, and we cannot really unknow something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we know stuff, and uh, then he kind of influences us. Yes, but the course. way we process it is is different. Is the, knowing stuff is a thing. What you do with it is another stuff. Another yeah, thing. yeah, okay. So meaning the notional understanding or or, or the understanding for the, the, the you know, learning the the the, the uh, encyclopedia, memorize it. Mm. It doesn't really do any good if you don't know how to interact this thing. The, uh, the notion just are just ingredients, but you have to be able to mix them properly then to, to produce something new. So uh, um, that's what um, Schmidt did. He he was it was it something that he did um, willingly, or maybe it's just because it's there. It's the language. People speak with the language, and uh, and and that comes out natural. Who knows, right? Who knows? We don't know how mm. how we process this, but the fact remains that these the past or the knowledge that we have of the past of, of, of artists, etc., has an influence on us. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. That's, and that's good. That's good. We can yeah, yeah, for sure. Separate ourselves from, from, you know, for the war, right? right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that that makes a lot of, um, you know, now that now that what we elab- that you elaborated a little bit more on the on that on that specific subject, that makes a ton of sense because I, I'm also uh, I, I also think of that very same thing that you just said that even if we don't directly know about something it still has an influence in the sense like for example for me a really big example is alphonse mucha mm-hmm. yeah. because it's like um he he was an artist um art nouveau or i think it was art nouveau like his his like the his uh, visual language influenced i don't i don't remember what decade he was from or whatever it was but he continues to influence the aesthetic Mm. of tattoo artists of just artists mm. in general of the aesthetic of posters uh, for mm. music or whatever it is like he had this very flowy very very really great language and i mean uh, you know the art nouveau uh, by default was very beautiful and very um respectful and revered of nature and stuff so he took he had that whole thing in his in his work and it's like even if a person has not heard the name alphonse mucha it's like they still saw something that was influenced by something that came before. So it's like, yeah, yeah even yeah. even yeah, even if somebody has only heard the name Picasso but still didn't hasn't seen like all of his work, it's like there's still like the idea still gets filtered through. And like mm-hmm. that also makes me think of the idea and and uh, we're we're all we're almost done. I'm not going to take like a ton of your time or anything. Um but um I've also thought once or twice about the idea that m- my body or just like the body is a filter. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of makes me think of the transformation and alchemy that you were talking about in terms of art where, where, you know, like in your case, you take 
all of these fragments of things that you find or whatever it is and you find interesting and fascinating and, and you know, you, you're curious about and you rearrange them and you make something else. And so, like, those objects went through the, bo- the filter of your body, you know, mm-hmm. your mind, uh, your eyes, you know, the touch, touching them and then rearranging them and all of that. And then you drew them in this new way. And so, like, the drawing is the result. It's like a distillation in a way. It's like a, something that was filtered out from all of the information that you absorbed through your body, you know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that out because the, the biological aspect of, of creativity is, is very often neglected. And I think that we cannot, we cannot pretend we are not, we are, we are not flesh and bones. Oh and yeah, for sure. That has a big influence on us. Like, um, if you're sick, uh, if you're healthy, the hormones or the young or old, etc. Uh, if people get this mad or, you know, we have to pay the rent, we don't have it. So all these things in here kind of really influence our, our physical entity. And um, I think that in some cases, the, the um, art tend to be oh, too, too owned by, by, by crit- critical entities, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, where there's a, this appropriation of, of the conceptual component of the art is that the, that art is the result of, of a, 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 this complex machine that is the human body that uh, that re- reacts to stimuli yeah. in many different ways. Um, so that they need to be the, the, the biological component, I think, of art making needs to be reevaluated, which I think it is recently. Uh, they also also uh, the effect that, that that evolution, for example, biology has on aesthetic is something that is considered now by a few um a few art critics and researchers oh, Whereas, yeah because um there is this i can't remember what it's called uh, the, i read it years ago uh, the art instinct the art instinct art instinct art instinct so so the author um i, I make it short right um reacting to uh, a well discusses the, the reaction of a of a famous critic to uh, two Russian um, artists that um, created this painting based on interview. They interview people and they say, what would you like to see in a painting? And they say, landscape, deer, or, or uh, animals, mm-hmm. historical historical person, and uh, something like that. So they did that throughout throughout the world. Everybody wants to see those things. We'll see lake, mountain, animals, and the historical person. And so these are critics that well, that's terrible. There's probably corruption of the uh, of the taste of people because everybody likes abstract art. They only like two percent likes abstract art, right? But <laughs> so, <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then, uh, and then the objection of this critic was like, yeah, even people in Africa like lakes and mountains with snow when there is no lake and mountain of snow in Africa. And I was thinking, oh boy, you're ignorant, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There are actually <laughs> mountain with forests, in it. but just to say the stereotypical approach of this critic, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and the, so the author of this book, um, again, the art instinct was saying, what if instead uh, of uh, the reason, the reason for for the presence of people toward these uh, these specific landscape is that uh, is evolutionary. So mm-hmm. we learn to associate beauty, aesthetic, with condition that grant can guarantee our survival. So, yes. you know, so then we see a beautiful lake, a beautiful mountain, animals, and, and, and people, which is not our people in there, say, that's my place. We are social animals. We need a place where we can fish, swim, wash, drink, drink, mm-hmm. most people, right? Eat that beer that is now, right, frolicking in the, in, in, in the meadows, right, Bambi, right? And, uh, and yeah. <laughs> that is now beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, that yeah, that's that's awesome. Okay, I mean, so I really, I'm really cutting it, cutting it, like chopping it down with the mic. Well, I think so, right? But what I'm saying, uh, that that makes sense. Makes sense. It does. It's, it really okay. does. So this is um, so this is um, the art instinct is the name of the book. The art instinct in the in the name of the book. I can't remember the author. I have it somewhere, but if you probably Google the art instinct, yeah. it's yeah, uh, um, and the uh, yeah. I, I can't remember that. If, if one, I can look for it, look it up for it, so maybe you can post it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. No, no, that's um, that's extremely interesting. And I think it's also a really great place to close off the conversation. This That was very interesting and illuminating and just in um, edifying in general. 
So, uh, Roberto, I wonder if you can, in that case, now tell whoever is listening or watching where they can find your work. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have my website, but it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I was just there. It's not so bad at all. I mean, I got all this stuff in there. It's like a container I right, put in there and I never, <laughs> I never fix it up, right? So, um, but it, but it works. Be- you, yeah, I guess. Yeah, like, that's I, what matters. I need, to, I need to because I got everything in there, right? So, but I have my website, and uh, you think you posted your um, the? No, no, sorry, that's another interview. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that thing, I got confused. Um, if you want, I can, I can post the, I can send you the, the all the links to to my website, uh, and um, where people can see my work. Uh, also, maybe link to the books. Um, yeah. And some work that I did, for example, I did the work I, um, my artwork has been used uh, by um, a, a movie director to create oh. a music video for a, a musician, right? Uh, That's to awesome. To grind. It was fun. I That's very music. cool. And all these things came together so music and, and art, and then my art was animated by this Korean art. So it was a it was a Dutch uh, movie director with an Italian artist and a Korean animator. That's awesome. And, and an Armenian musician, right? So it was wow. kind of an inter- international, international thing. Global, yeah. And uh, and they, uh, they we all kind of lay between here in the states and uh, and, and and Holland, the states and, uh, and Venice, the state in Korea. So it's kind of really this contamination, if you want, of yeah. talent, right? And uh, and that creates something that was already transcendent, meaning it was my artwork. But then my artwork took another life. It jumped mm. into the video, right? It jumped into music video, it working together with music. So I think, well, that that's good. Yes. That works. So there's this video that shows my artwork that is kind of animated and it's kind of... It so is ha- the, uh, it's a Tigran, T-I-G-R-A-N is the... Um, I can send you. I can send you the. Yeah, yeah. You you should send me the the link to that video and whatever links you want me to put um, on the video description because I mean your website is robertaosti.com, right? Yes. yes. And I mean you have there your classes, you have their drawings that are for sale, you have the books yeah. also. I mean I'm gonna put the links to the website and the books and the video when you when you send it to me. I'm gonna put the links on there anyway. But on your website you have everything already because I, I saw. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's everything. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Oh, they're gonna put it, my my daughter says my Instagram and YouTube, but uh, yes, um, Instagram, but, yes, they are there, right? Thank you, Lima. Uh, yeah, good idea. I'm gonna, yeah, That's I'm smart. gonna, I'm gonna, uh, but you have those already, right? Or you, yeah, I do have your website and the Instagram and oh, the YouTube actually, also. Um, and um, I think the only one I'm, I'm, I'll be missing is the video that you're talking about. The video, okay, yeah, okay. all right, I'm gonna send you all this stuff, and uh, it was been a pleasure, today. absolutely, I'm, likewise, really seeing you again and know that your work, I see all your work that you do, you're quite a quite the war machine you just keep cranking them out that's nice right that's nice right so I, a beautiful work really beautiful work so i uh, i like the, the way you elongate the neck you subtly and elegant elegantly transform the transform the human the human yeah. um a, a a a colleague of mine that um uh, I, I was uh, i was in a show which she organized a show uh she titled the show uh uh the, the it was about the human figure. Mm-hmm. She, she titled it "The Infinite Subject." The uh, infinite subject. Yeah, that's this awesome. Might, I think it was kind of beautiful title. That's perfect. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, the human body is an infinite subject. Yeah, really. We, we have been at it for like a thirty thousand years that we know of. From the beginning, yeah. From the beginning, I just keep painting with people like yeah, arrows, yeah. kind of shaman and stuff. And that's 35 years ago. So now we're still yeah, moving. Right? At least. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Well, um, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for your thoughts and your words, Roberta. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being in the podcast here. Now I'm going to cut off the recording.